All right, I think I look sufficiently handsome. Bench, a podcast about community. I'm your host, Grayson Quay, and today's guest is Rachel Van Til. Rachel was an alumna of Grove City College, which is my alma mater, and she went on from there to make wine her passion and her career. Rachel is an advanced sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers and is the lead sommelier at a prestigious Houston area country club. You will hear the word sommelier a lot in this episode, and I think I'm saying it right. If not, don't tell me, I'll be embarrassed. Uh, Rachel is also a silence breaker. Last year, she bravely spoke up, along with a number of other women, to bring to light a pattern of sexual misconduct that was occurring within the sommelier community. I had a really good time talking with Rachel. We discussed wine and the roles it plays in human activities, ranging from worship to relaxation to celebration, and what that says about us as social and embodied creatures. And we also talked a little bit about the dark side of community and what can happen when those patterns of abuse and exploitation creep in. So I hope you will enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed my conversation with Rachel. Um, Rachel, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, So Rachel and I actually were at Grove City College, but I don't think at the same time. What year did you graduate? 2013. So I think we overlapped a little bit. We would have overlapped for one year, yeah, because I graduated in 2016, so I got there in 2012. So your senior year was my freshman year, I guess. I don't think I met you, though. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. Um, I took a year off from college, took a slow year my junior year, and I did 48 credits my senior year. Oh, my God. So basically, I had no life. How did you manage Um, that? I... the intercessions and just cramming as many um, Bible courses in as possible. I didn't want to stay there another year, so okay. It just made it happen. You were uh, were you an English major like me? I was, yes. Okay, yeah. Um. So, yeah. How did you How did you like Grove City? I I mean, I know there's kind of that joke about college where you can choose between good grades. A uh, thriving social life and enough sleep. Um, So it sounds like you um, certainly weren't on the social life side of that your senior year. Um, But otherwise, did you you have a good uh, experience at Grove City? I would say for the most part, um, I didn't choose any one of those three things as a priority. I chose what I would like to call my intellectual life. Um, So I really like enjoyed my classes. Some of them I put more energy into than others. Um, I enjoyed, you know, doing research and writing on the things that I cared about and, you know, didn't necessarily give an A game to the things I didn't, um, which like is now, especially that I'm not um, in a field related to my major. I'm very, very happy that I did. Um, Grove City was like a very interesting culture, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Very specific. Um, I like a lot of the sort of ideas uh, that came into play, obviously, like a very Christian um, worldview. Sometimes I think to the point of being scared to explore, which I'm yeah. sure we're going to get into that a little bit more later. Um, but I mean, I would say 75% like satisfaction of that. And, you know, in your 20s, I guess that's a pretty good score. Yeah, I've always really admired people who have that ability to, like you said, kind of really invest in those things that matter to them and, you know, kind of pay less attention to the things that matter less. Um, I think that's, uh, in many ways, I think that's a big sign of maturity um, to say like, okay, here's my priorities and here are the things I care about and I'm not going to devote as much energy to things just because other people tell me they're important, right? Yeah, for sure. And I would say like, if there's one lesson I've learned in my 20s, it's okay, how can I, as best as I possibly can, live life on my own terms to make myself as happy as possible, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And I feel like I've done that somewhat successfully and especially successfully in the last four years. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I I know that 
for most of my undergrad, for, for all of high school, especially, and then for all of undergrad, pretty much, I was really, really kind of hyper-conscious of grades. And that's one thing I wish I could kind of go back and undo is just this obsession with, with always having A's. Um, when I got to grad school, I quickly kind of figured out that the grades didn't really matter as much. Um, and I kind of stopped caring about them too. So that was a that was a real load off my shoulders, I remember. Um, and I just remember thinking. When, when you say that grades don't matter as much in grad school, what do you mean? Because I thought about going to grad school and, and kind of decided it wasn't for me. And I'll probably always wonder what that mm -hmm. would have looked like. So I don't know if it's different in other programs. I did an MA program at Georgetown in English. And the way it worked there basically was like, if you did the work and just absolutely killed it, you could get an A+. Plus. Um, if you just did the work, you got an A, basically. Um, and then if you, and it was and then if you did the work and it was like a little subpar, you could get an A minus. Um, but if you just like clearly couldn't hack it, they would give you a B, basically. But a B kind of came with the understanding that like maybe this program isn't the place for you. Um, wow. Yeah, so that was that was kind of grades were much more kind of informal. Um, you know, I suppose you could have gotten an F if you just didn't do any work, but it, you would have had to work at it. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, it was it was really nice kind of being in a community that was much more. You know, when you're in grad school, you're kind of only taking classes in your specialty, so it's much more intentional. Everyone there wants to be there and is there for a specific reason. So. You almost don't really need grades anymore to kind of keep you in Did line. you find that it was a place where you had um, a chance to explore what interested you, at you? Or did you feel like the boxes were so preconceived in terms of like specific subjects and specialties that they were pretty confining? And boxes. Yeah, pretty pretty much boxes. Oh, yeah. So um, brutal. Yeah. I think that was I, the thing. Um, Sorry, go ahead. I definitely have mixed feelings about, about having gone to grad school. I don't know if I'd do it again, but... It was really funny. So um, my senior year in Grove City, I um, did like a senior thesis project. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about this because I know this is kind of the first step in how you went from English major thinking about pursuing graduate studies in English to small Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really kind of funny story. Um, I mean, you sat in on all of the same professors and probably a lot of the same classes that I did. And in what I love about Grove City is you get a specific point of view, often a very strong one, um, kind of regarding how to deal with things like race relations or um, different um, literary critics, Foucault, for instance. Um, so, um, you know, we, we went through all these courses and um, I had a fellow English major who was a year ahead of me, who was much, much smarter than me, um, basically tell me that um, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow was the most difficult book written in the English language in the 20th century. Oh. And he kind of implied that I might not be able to tackle it. Um, so, of course, challenge accepted, right? It's like, oh, I'm not mm -hmm. going to let you get away with telling me I'm not smart. Um, <laughs> so I tackled it. And the first read was horrible. I was like just pushing through, just like reading to read through it. Right. And there was so yeah. much of that my last year because I had such a long reading list with the credits I was taking. Mm -hmm. um, I got to a point where I couldn't read. I'm kind of ADD. Um, I couldn't read without a pen. I would have to read with a pen like this mm -hmm. as I'm going through. And then if something oh, like wow. struck me as important, I would have to reread it three times and underline it. Um, but that was the only way I was going to remember anything I read. So I read it through once. No, not even with a pen, just because, like, it's so difficult that, like, I like I didn't know where it was going or where we were going to end up. Second time, I reread it with my pen. Oh, my word. Like, life-changingly good. But I felt like that was only the tip of the iceberg. So then I read it a third time uh, when I was writing my senior thesis um, that final year of college. But um, it was a book that um, was written in the 70s, like, kind of, like, psychedelic, postmodern, nonlinear plot. Um, you know, Nazis and um, all sorts of cr like crazy um, psychedelic experiences that are part of it. Um, but basically, I applied a Bakhtinian critique to it. So, um, Akhil Bakhtin basically argues that like 
um, there's a carnival element um, of society that's like subverting the order, right? So if you take the idea of carnival as it relates to the church, it was kind of like, well, the church is this way to live where there's all these patterns and these rules and this very ordered life. Um, and and um, people at the bottom, especially kind of the peasant level, but really everybody can't exist in a, a world that's that ordered and perfect mm -hmm. for yeah. any long period of time. So the church would sanction in the Middle Ages um, these carnival events, right? Um, like if you are familiar with like the Lord of Misrule or, or kind of uh, that concept, um, there was like a sanctioned time to misbehave. And it's yeah. all about, you know, like fornication and dirty humor and subverting the social structure. So the person who's at the top of the social structure is then at the bottom of it. And they crown one of these peasant folk um, kind of like, for a day right and it's all sorts of mayhem yeah this um, is where they would have the the boy bishop right where they would they would pick a child and give them a little bishop's mitre and you know everyone would have to do what this little kid said right yeah so well he anyways so Bakhtin kind of explicates this and says that like basically that um y you see this pattern a lot in literature so cool so I applied it to this novel because it seemed to me it to be a really really good match because a lot of the imagery is like like how, like the way he deals with this sort of crisis um, of like World War II and whatever um, is largely with, you know, humor. Because how else are you supposed to tackle something that's that big and traumatic on kind of like a, a global consciousness, consciousness scale, if that's even like a phrase. Um, so I did that and turned in my paper and I'm sure I could have done better if I hadn't had so many classes, but I was just trying to get things done. But that was the thing I cared the most about that year. And what was hilarious to me is only one person, only one of our English uh, major professors, like in the entire suite had read the novel and they hadn't mm -hmm. read it in probably 15 to 20 years. And so the person who was grading my paper hadn't read the novel that they were critiquing um, or, or for my paper. Nor do I think were they particularly um, well-versed in Bakhtin. I could be wrong about that. But basically, what was kind of the implication of, of what the letter um, that came back with my paper was like, you could have done this in a much more redemptive way. Like you could have done this with like more of a Wendell Berry kind of focus on like nature and innate goodness. Whereas I was saying that like, in order to make sense of this crazy, tragic reality, you have to like you don't get to sugarcoat it or just kind of waltz up and say, well, like, I believe in Jesus, everything's okay, which I don't think they were necessarily trying to say, but like, you got to deal with this in harsh terms. Um, and and um, it really turned me off from, you know, wanting to, to go that direction um, because I felt like grad school, if I went to, into like a Christian program would probably um be really uh limiting and the more I thought about it I thought well maybe most grad school programs would be very limiting in terms of freedom of thought and how I want to do what I want to do and then it was sort of like well um if I'm arguing that um freedom to like behave a certain if, if I'm arguing that there's a primal need for like dirty humor and like all of this other stuff like maybe it's not better to go to grad school and kind of climb your way up the ivory tower just to preach at other um intellectuals maybe i ought to try to find a place where this mentality um can kind of uh infiltrate my life in a way that makes sense to me and brings me freedom because the reason i write is to try to find things that ring true and if this rings true to me, then maybe I should find a different career path. And I got into restaurants. Okay. That's, I guess, the, the short answer. Yeah. So how do you just sketch out the, the intellectual arc there a little more? How do you get from, uh, how do you get from the Bakhtinian carnivalesque, um, you know, this kind of subversion of the established order that's mm -hmm. kind of highly focused on the body and specifically on the... Um, less honorable parts, as St. Paul might say, of the body. Um, right. How do you get from there to restaurants and to being a sommelier? Where does, what did that look so, like? So um, wine is kind of like the happy medium, right? 
like it's a very fancy beverage um but it also still gets you drunk i guess we have to go back a little further um i took a year off of school after becoming um very ill um i was struggling with eating disorders um it was really debilitating for me as well as a lot of anxiety um and i think that really stemmed for me from like a kind of perfectionistic hatred of my body right um it was something to be made better and better and perfect and like maybe i could achieve some bizarre ideal um and it really messed with the way i i interacted with the world right because i was trying to control everything all the time um and also i think like we're in this really weird situation where in the united states especially like we're a very wealthy country like food is there's always too much of it but you still need it and how do you navigate that right um particularly where as a woman so much of your self esteem and how people view you um has to do with your appearance um and that was really hard on me um so like i got a little better and i you know stumbled my way through the rest of college uh with varying degrees of success um but then when i graduated uh i was working in a winery while i was trying to figure out where i was going to apply what i wanted to do um and uh the som documentary came out and i had always loved wine i had i've worked in a winery um during the summers about half of my college career and i loved being able to describe the wines and sell them um but that was really the first time i was like oh this can be like a profession and it, and also you see these people kind of like obsess over the subject and like i have a very obsessive personality so it was like oh i can do something really hard that's really sensory and really intellectual that incorporates history geology and flavor profiles like and alcohol what's not to mm -hmm. love um and then you know I, who hasn't read kitchen confidential and, and and heard anthony bourdain and all this stuff it's like that i had worked in some diners um during high school and it was just like a place that i really always enjoyed because you go to work you run around you're on your feet you're interacting with your, with people um it's all very like on the fly and you have to be with it and you're engaged with your body and you're doing 8 million things at a time um and then at the end of the day you walk home with you know a stack of cash and mm -hmm. you're tired and it's rewarding and then you go and do it again the next day and um i'd always really liked that pace but um so i graduated i decided that i was going to get a job in a restaurant um and kind of worked my way up from like hostess to um waitress and um then eventually was invited down to detroit to help open a wine program but that world always i always really loved it because it was a great way to really explore the sensory um as well as like um the intellectual side of things. And one thing I learned really quickly too in that first really good restaurant job was that like food meant something. And before that food had never meant anything to me. It was all, you know, like everything was just there was too much of it and um I like this and I don't like that, but like it wasn't something I spent time thinking about like where did this come from? What does it mean? And where I was working was a very farm to table like whole animal um butchery program kind of place and once you saw how the the butcher worked how the chef put things together um these kind of old italian recipes that each represent a culture because i mean it, italy is like however many cultures because it's not really one country if you look at it historically right um you got to see how meaningful each one of these things was so when i could slow down and appreciate that um it really gave me a whole new level of like personal freedom from like um being kind of enslaved to food to being like fascinated by it and wanting to study it and really appreciating it yeah there's a there's a quote from bakhtin that i remember you sharing i think this was probably a number of years ago but i saw it on facebook and it really grabbed me and it was i'll have to paraphrase it but it was something to do with um eating is kind of the action whereby humans most kind of concretely confront the physical world in a particular mm -hmm. way in in a way that kind of transcends the barriers between me as the human like the hermetically sealed ident like person with an individual identity and like the physical world outside of me yeah like the place where those two kind of permeate each other and where you know if it's if it's done well and it's done um you know in a way that's really kind of valuing and approaching it well you know you come out on top right you you yeah. kind of take the world into you and 
remake it in your image in a, in a sense, right? Yeah, you conquer it. And then eventually you use the bathroom, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Which is yeah. like kind of hilarious. And I think that this was like the other thing that I didn't get about Grove City. Like it always felt like they were a little bit scared of like, like talking about like sex or talking about like, like, you know, like shit is natural, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I even think at some point it's, it's kind of hilarious because there are points in the Bible where like, if we weren't so used to it, we would see really strong, very bodily focused language, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, I and translators often kind of rubbish. translate. Yeah, and translators yeah, right? usually translate around that, yeah. Yeah, or even like Song of Solomon, right? Like, if you take away kind of the King James, like, skirting around certain things, you end up in a very different place. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so that was, that was interesting. Hold on, just one second. Lost your video, yeah. Yeah, I just had a call. I'm gonna, am I back? All right, cool. Yeah, you're back, yeah. Um, and like, I just, I always felt like, and I was like living a pretty, you know, conservative Christian lifestyle, but like, I always felt like if I'm really free in Christ, then like, what should I, why am I, why are we so afraid of these things? And I loved to, you know, in, in kitchen culture, which is like horribly dirty and, you know, sometimes incredibly vulgar, but like the jokes are hilarious, <laughs> like, and there's no bounds or limits, but I didn't find it threatening. It just, it was, it, you know, my dad always used to say, like, he always let me watch war movies at a pretty young age, like very violent um, films, Black Hawk Down, I think I, I watched when I was in fifth or sixth grade, um, well before I was allowed to watch something like Lord of the Rings. Um, but even with the language, mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the rationale behind that was like, in these really um, psychologically strenuous situations in a battlefield, so to speak, um, this is normal and appropriate behavior. Well, if you try working a 12 hour shift in a kitchen, um, jam packed with a ton of pressure and somebody yelling at you, maybe that's natural that you kind of end up, you know, making that kind of joke, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, I just, again, like it was something that like, was funny and enjoyable and fast paced and exciting and I really like vibed with so yeah no I, I what you said about kind of the the brand of humor is really interesting there's a a line for there's a passage from C.S. Lewis that's who I did my uh master's thesis on um I love that. But there's a passage from Miracle his book Miracles where I think it's Miracles where he's talking about um just kind of clues that humans might be something more than just incredibly evolved animals Mm -hmm. And he says, for him, you know, one of those clues is the fact that we make jokes about sex and excrement and stuff like that, because it's, it's like funny to us, because we have these animal bodies that have to perform these animal functions. Um, but at the same time, we are these, you know, higher rational beings, but we still have to poop and we still have to, you know, have sex, which is kind of <laughs> undignified when viewed from the outside, right? <laughs> um, so he said, yeah, the fact that we think that's funny kind of conveys this sense of of solidarity and also this sense that, you know, there is there is something more to us that we aren't just animals. And that's why we find those things hilarious. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I've always thought that was, he was I'm really so glad that, something there. <laughs> I'm so glad that you kind of like vibe with this because so often I have a very difficult time broaching it with my Christian friends. Um, but if you try to broach it with your secular friends, that, I mean, that doesn't always go so well either, right? Because you end up, you can end up in a very different place. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting, right? There's always a, there's always like a, I think it's in a way you kind of end up in a difficult place where, you know, I obviously do have friends who are, who are Christians and I have friends who aren't Christians. And, you know, some of the friends who are Christians tend to be a lot more kind of straight laced, right? And then, um, and you know, maybe we share some some kind of moral commitments, certainly, but then I have, you know, secular friends that I can definitely uh, joke around more with and maybe kind of, uh, kind of vibe with our senses of humor a little better, but they might not share kind of the moral commitments. So I think there is something interesting in thinking like, well, okay, how do I kind of imaginatively and honestly and redemptively engage with the fact that I have this body and that, yes, it's the source of a number of temptations and distractions and so on, but it's also good, right? That um, that's kind of the, 
the core idea of the incarnation in Christianity, right? That this this body is good, the physical world is good, and we need to engage with that physical world through our bodies. So it, we should probably figure out how to do that and how to think about that and how to talk about that mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, ignoring certain parts of it. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely on on board with you. And I think that kind of coming at that through food is is particularly interesting. And then you know, through wine especially, right? There's there's a there's a special sense in which um, you know wine kind of serves as the way in which we interact with the world uh, through our bodies. Um, you know, as alcohol, it's a source of enjoyment, but also a source of temptation, and then it also plays a special role in the you know sacrament of the Eucharist. So there's there's so much in play there, right? So much. Um... You know, I always, like, when we talk about really great wine, um, you know, there's wine at every level, right? And it should be something that some level can be enjoyed over dinner yeah. and not be a big deal. It doesn't always have, have some, to be expensive. I have some Francia Chardonnay here, I figured, in honor of our conversation. Delightful. Yeah. I wish I was well prepared. I'm in my office at work, so I'm okay. holding off till I get home. But, um, <laughs> you know... Not all, like there should be table wine, right? Which is like something to enjoy with a meal and it's not particularly complicated. Um, the, uh, you know, Italians would say, you know, tabla, table wine, craft wine, yeah. right? That's part of it. But then, you know, you look at these really expensive wines, wines that um, go for auction at t over $10,000 bottle. You kind of look at that and think, well, wow, that seems like a lot for a really old liquid in a glass bottle that may or may not be okay. Um, but most wines can't do that. And the ones that can, it's kind of like a really extraordinary piece of artwork, only it's temporal, right? Once you open up that wine, you have a very short period of time to enjoy it. Mm. And wine, you know, you know, you can't wine and for, to open it up, right? If you can't really old wine, the oxygen is going to kill it very quickly. So it might only taste really good for about 30 minutes but it might blow your mind in that period of time. So you're saying you just and have I, to like, if you buy a really expensive bottle of wine, you just gotta chug it. <laughs> well, no, you gotta share it over dinner with other people. Uh, okay. <laughs> it would be really, really sad to enjoy a really, really great wine by yourself. And I think that's <laughs> I mean, where I we- I suppose you could. Yeah, and I think that's where we get into the community aspect of it. So how does that play into it? Because I remember you've mentioned something about how like one reason you got into you know, food and especially into wine was so you could help people come together and help people celebrate, right? Yeah, I think that it was always uh, an extraordinarily rewarding shift for me when I got to kind of create an experience for a birthday or an anniversary um, or see a family come together, um, especially when you have like parents or grandparents incorporate like younger kids, not like little kids, but like kids that are starting to get some sensibility of what's happening and maybe care a little bit or maybe appreciate it a little bit, you know? Um, even in their teens, I think people like, like this is the first time you have a really beautifully, uh, I don't know, plated like pork chop with like parsnips to the side and whatever, just like the, the, like appreciate the beautiful nature and then hopefully delicious nature of what's in front of you. And then with young wine drinkers too, kind of see them get their sea legs with what they like and how, like whether or not they're even willing to ask questions, to learn about it, or it's too intimidating, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just being present and being able to create those experiences for people, um, was, was really valuable and, and it still really is. I think the best thing I get to do in my new position, I now work at a country club is, um, whereas in restaurants you maybe see somebody once a year for their anniversary, right? And you pull out of all the stops and there's complimentary champagne and maybe a little extra dessert wine and free dessert, you know, and then you pace everything out and it's beautiful and there's candles on the table. Um, in a country club, you get to know your members preferences and you build much closer relationships with them so mm. um, I'm really enjoying that so far just um, taking the time to get to know somebody and then personalize the hospitality um, yeah. I feel like it's a, like the best job in the world to be honest with you yeah I think there's something really beautiful about that so I married um, into a very Italian family obviously um, yes and one thing I've noticed is you know, whether I'm just at their house or whether we're going out to dinner, just how much food there is, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, 
if we're if we're at their house and they have company over for like a holiday or something, there's you know a million different hors d'oeuvres. There's so much food, and even if we just go out to dinner, they'll order like four appetizers for the table before we even like get entrees. Um, so I think it really says something about how you know human experiences of community and uh, you know friendship and even love are kind of mediated through food and through through these other physical things, right? Um, I do wonder, you know, why the Protestant church has gotten so far away from the Catholic traditions of fasting and feasting as a community. I wish that more Protestant denominations did that because it's kind of this the, like cycle of the year and like different things in their seasons. Um, and there's time for deprivation and looking inward and there's a time for maybe excess and looking outward too. Yeah, it occurs to me that we could do more of that. Yeah, oh, I definitely agree. Um, kind of since college, I've really, um, you know, I'm still an Anglican, but I've, I consider myself like a pretty high church Anglican. But I've really been reading a lot more and learning a lot more about Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy because I think that that's something that those two, you know, forms of Christianity do very well is kind of not only have fasting and feasting, right, where you sort of acknowledge, right, like what I do with my body matters, right? It's not just about, and I think this extends, right? Because I think there is a, a temptation, you know, among certain Protestants to think of Christianity as like a set of boxes you have to check, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, I believe this and this and this, you know, I answered yes to all the questions um, and now I can go to heaven, right? Um, whereas I think, yeah, if you, if you take a faith tradition where you, are worshiping with all of your senses, right? Where you have, you know, where you have truly beautiful and complex music and you have incense and you have fasts and feasting and you have beautiful art. Um, there is this sense where it's like, no, this isn't just me kind of mentally assenting to certain things and holding the right opinions. This is a sort of holistic transformation of my entire being and my entire identity um, to be conformed to the, the image of Christ, right? Which yeah, is why I, one reason I was so drawn to uh, the idea of having you as a guest here, because I think that, you know, as a sommelier, that's something that, you know, you could- Your really pronunciation of it is, is, is very good, by the way. Okay, I, I have I been really so nervous that. about that the whole time. <laughs> yeah, som for sure, if you feel uh, uncomfortable okay. with the French, um, or like sommelier, but like run it sommelier. together. But it's funny how many people like trip themselves up over that word. Yeah. I've been called a Somalian. That's Somalian. probably my, oh, there you go. a Somalian. <laughs> my uh, favorite. Very it's very endearing, though. Mm -hmm. um, it's really funny. I would probably be in a similar place to, to where you are at. Um, but when I started dating my husband, well, so first of all, I'm in the South, right? It's so, like, remember everything Dr. Messer said about the South. Like, I don't <laughs> hate it. Um, like, it's <laughs> definitely this, weird, there's a lot of, like, conflation of, like, morality and niceness that I find, like, a little exhausting and somewhat terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so interesting. But I'm so I d started dating my husband, and he's like very spirit filled, non denominational. Mm -hmm. But what's funny is that like, he, and he just like is terrified of Catholicism, not mm -hmm. terrified, but like he just does not get it. Um, is that some of those traditions, in terms of like how they actually operate? are maybe closer to Catholicism than some of the like Presbyterian in between places, right? In terms of things like fasting and feasting and um, kind of how they approach certain things, which I think is interesting. Um, interesting. But getting back to what you were saying, um, just to backtrack a little bit um, about like some of the temptations that you can fall into, because mm -hmm. I think those are important to address as well. You know? Yeah, and I was definitely interested in kind of hearing more about the you know, obviously you had your episode with your, your struggle with eating disorders, right? So there is, so you've kind of seen both sides of this, right? You had this very bad experience with food and with kind of engaging the world as an embodied being. And now it seems like your, your profession has become engaging that in a, a way that's beautiful and redemptive and that brings people together and that um, gives you kind of freedom and enjoyment without taking you into a bad place. Yeah. Most of the time, I would say, like, first of all, I spit out more wine than I drink because um, you can't not <laughs> in yeah. my profession. Um, I taste thousands of wines 
um, in a year and, um, you know, at these professional events, like these tasting events, um, if you don't spit, you're in a really bad place to not only uh, assess whether the wine is good and whether you want to buy it um, or bring it into your restaurant, but uh, you also don't want to be that person in that room with yeah. all of your professional <laughs> colleagues. Um, you, you, you know who hasn't been spitting if you go to any of these things. But um, when I was 21 and, m you know, moderately inebriated at a wine festival with my mother, we ran into a master sommelier. And I'll never forget, my mom was looking at the certification at that point, and he said to her, you know, there's very few people who master wine before it masters them. And mm. I have definitely seen how it can kind of take over and become a very unhealthy part of life. And I mean, even in my profession, I would say that like drinking is normalized um, mm. to a point that can be difficult to navigate. Like that is the social, like that is what you do to socialize. You go out and you eat and drink. Um, so like that's something that finding balance with is difficult. Um, and for me, I've found the necessity of, you know, how we order our church lives, like ordering my personal life. Like I think last year I did a whole 30 three times, right? Because you can only eat so much foie gras, <laughs> right? And drink so much wine before you say, okay, I need like a break mm -hmm. and a reset, you know, a month at a time without drinking or like any crazy food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Um, I, I really like that idea of like few people master master wine before it masters them, right? Yeah, because there's this sense of kind of the purpose of the, you know, the purpose of asceticism, right? The purpose of kind of fasting and of denying yourself things isn't to, right? I've read this as the difference between like the approach to that in, kind of Buddhism versus Christianity, right? So like in Buddhism or in Eastern religion, there's the sense that you deprive your body because your body is a distraction or an illusion, right? Um, and your goal is to achieve this state of detachment from everything, right? Whereas mm -hmm. in Christianity, you deny your body things and you deny yourself the good things of the world because the world is good and your body is good. And it, um, so you should, so you should master it and treat it properly um, and kind of keep things in perspective, right? I've always, I've always found that really, really interesting. I did want to ask you, how do you talk about wine as a sommelier? Because there's this, there's this, I forget who said it, but there's this famous quote that writing about music is like dancing about architecture, mm -hmm. right? So it is, and it's something that I have no real sense of. Like, I don't have a terribly refined palate. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen, like, they've done these studies where they give people, where so much of it is in people's heads, where they'll, like, give someone a, you know, a glass of Franzi a wine, but tell them that it's, you know, $50 a glass, and they'll go, oh, yes, this is incredible. Thank you. Like, oh, um, <laughs> I hate those. Do you know how many of those I've watched in my career? <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I was just curious how to, I, I'm so impressed by the kind of refinement of people's palates where this is kind of one of your, one of your senses, but it's so refined to the point that you, it's an entire profession, right? And so how do you talk yeah, about it? How do you communicate like, what a wine tastes like? <laughs> I really hope Dr. Drake watches this, but I'm also terrified that when he does, if he does, it's going to be like, this is going to be like the most um, not perfect way I could do this, but yeah. like so. Dr. Drake ideally, is our art history professor from Melissa. yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, who is extraordinarily good and like yes. just the way he opened up my eyes, at least to understanding how to talk about art or understand art, um, was mm -hmm. amazing. And so much of it has to do with like you know historical context. And I think wine is very much the same way. Um, I think the hardest thing is trying to ascertain what experience a person has had because it's very easy to talk above people or seemingly condescend to them. <laughs> like my job, it like puts me in the perfect position to come off as like a total jerk. So navigating mm -hmm. that is really difficult. So usually, I mean, the, the best first question I can ask is what do you usually drink? And if you were to say Franzia, I would say, oh, well, do you want something like rich and buttery, like a Chardonnay, right? 
So you give a description and then you give a concrete thing that those two things usually go together or something um, crisp and herbaceous like a Sauvignon Blanc, right? So even if you don't necessarily think the wine is crisp or herbaceous, but you know you like Sauvignon Blanc, well, okay, then we're in a category where I can make sense of it, right? Uh -huh. um, usually that's the easiest way to start that conversation. If I can get a few reference points for where a person's palate is, then I'm going to probably pitch them three things and then give them a few descriptors of how they vary from a different thing, right? And of course, price is, is always a huge part of the question, right? And you never want yeah. to put somebody in a place where they feel uncomfortable. So usually you'll throw out a few different things at a few different price points. And if they kind of lean towards one but aren't committed then you can keep going down that rabbit hole like do you like fruity or earthy they're like well i think i like earthy or i want to try an earthy wine and you suggest something italian but maybe they're not comfortable with the pronunciation or maybe they went to tuscany with their dad and mom and didn't really like the wines there so you try something else italian and you end up with like a barbera or something that's you know a good balance um that's usually how that conversation goes right um one of the coolest things about being a sommelier is I always used to um, watch people taste and be like, oh, like you, a super palate, whatever. There's like definitely a tech, there's technique to tasting. Um, and once you learn how to do that, it opens up understanding wine um, in a way that's still difficult, but maybe like maybe not as um overwhelming as it seems on the front end of it okay yeah i did yeah. go i did go wine tasting once with with meg actually your, your younger sister yes and, um so which the way she taught me to do it was i'm gonna do it with franzia which is a waste of time but um was do you want me to super, go grab a glass because we can do this you can yeah go for it um okay <laughs> so yeah go ahead if you want if you want one to. second absolutely <laughs> Cut out some of this dead air here. I should just say, Grayson, that um, I'm a solid white wine drinker. Okay. I like sparkling wine the best, but if I could drink only sparkling and white, I'd probably be fine with it. There you go. Yeah, that's, I found that that's my favorite too. Like, I'll drink red wine with like, I'll drink red wine with dinner if I'm having like a steak or something, but typically mm -hmm. I don't just want like a glass of red wine by itself, whereas with white, I can just sit and drink white wine and, and love it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so walk me through this, right? You you stick your nose in it first. Mm. Well, first you observe the color, right? Okay. So I don't know if you can tell, but this is a white wine. Okay. That's important. Yeah. And then you kind of say, well, is this really golden yellow, which mine is? I don't okay. know if you can see that. Yeah. Um, or is this almost water white, or is it somewhere in the middle? If it's water white, it's probably going to be something leaning more towards light bodied. If it's got a color like this, you can probably expect more body, maybe some oak, or maybe it's older, um, or it's aged in some way. So the color can actually tell you a lot. Okay. It's crazy. So body is kind of like how heavy it tastes, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of objective factors there as well. Mm -hmm. If you have like um, a Sauvignon Blanc that's 12% alcohol, Mm -hmm. that's pretty light in alcohol right like if you were to take a, a glass of water and a glass of vodka you were to swirl both you'd be mm -hmm. able to see the vodka stuck to the glass more right and the water yeah. mm -hmm. kind of sheeted and fell off but then if you were to put the vodka in your mouth it kind of coats in a way do you know yeah. what i mean like there's <laughs> that and that's kind of when we say like body that's as much what we're talking about as anything else sure. or like okay. a really sweet wine will have that sugar that will kind of coat as well dark let me turn my light on here <laughs> um so i would do that first okay and then so the first the thing color. i'm going to okay. do when i put the, the the glass up to my nose is i'm going to say how difficult is this to smell 
Okay. Is this jumping out of the glass or do I have to work for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this color wise, I'd say it's kind of in the middle. It's not like a real dark yellow, but it's got some kind of transparency to it, I guess. No. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's pretty easy to smell. Um, pretty right. aromatic. Those wines are made pretty well and made to be consumed right away, which, you know, I think they do a really good job of actually, Francia does. Mm -hmm. So then I'm going to say, okay, is there fruit in my wine? And if so, I'm going to say, is it like citrus? Is it orchard? Is it tropical? And I'm going to pick out maybe two or three. And then I'm going to say, is this really tart or is this ripe or is this candied? Okay. I'm going to try Sure, so tart, okay, what, what would ripe be? So most, <laughs> sorry, figuring out my setup here. Um, most wine will have some sort of, white wine will have like a citrus component, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, this is like Meyer lemon, right? So that would mm -hmm. imply some sweetness or ripeness. Now, if it was really tart, I would say this is like lemon pith or lemon juice. And if this was like lemon in a candied way, I'd say, um, like lemon meringue or lemon drops. Okay. All right. So let me, hmm. All right. This is going to be where I have a harder time. Um, my, uh, my nose has never been great. Um, <laughs> it's all practice. Okay. So you I'm smelling for, how many times I've done this. so I'm smelling for fruit. I'm smelling for like citrus, right? Uh-huh. Okay. It smells I can't like identify what fruit I'm smelling, but it smells sweet. I'd say it's probably more on the like candied side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I, that, I mean, that's what I'm getting at least. <laughs> I love that. Um, so then, you know, you're gonna check for oak, which neither of our wines are oaky, but you would look for something that smelled like cinnamon or baking spices or shortbread cookies. Um, and neither of our wines mm -hmm. are probably oak, if I had to guess. Okay. Um, and then, you kind of run down a checklist. Is the wine super floral? If so, is it like white flowers or, you know, mm -hmm. like, like jasmine, hibiscus, like you try to find the right one. Is it herbaceous? If so, like what kind of herbs? Um, is there honey? Is it older? Um, and then uh, is it earthy? So that actually to me is what's pivotal about this wine. And I really like um, wines from Europe. So often like we'll use the term earthy and people are like, well, what does that mean? Like, um, so a lot of times we'll say like cement, wet rocks, damp hay, right? Like those sorts of things. So this to me is like beeswax. Okay. Like a lot of Meyer lemon and beeswax. All right. And like damp hay and mushrooms. Oh, wow. We're, <laughs> we're getting away. And then like a little there. bit of lemongrass. It's delightful. Um, so then, okay, you kind of get a sense of what it smells like, and then you taste it, and you say, well, does it taste the same way that it smells? Mm -hmm. Which is, okay. like, actually kind of an interesting and difficult thing to unpack. So, well, because, might... like, most of tasting <laughs> is smelling, right? Yes At least a big no. chunk of it. Okay. Flavor, yes. But that's where you get into the technical part of wine tasting. Because everything we've done except look at the wine and assess its color and its body, um have been somewhat subjective, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at the color, you can measure that. And when you see how much it sheets the glass, right? The legs, um, that's measurable. Mm -hmm. So then you taste the wine. Mm -hmm. Sure. And the first thing you should ask yourself is, is my wine sweet? Maybe a little, not terribly. So it's actually a difficult question. Is it sweet? Is it fruity? Those are two different things. So when you're tasting, yeah. the front part of your tongue will pick up sugar. Huh. And then the sides of your tongue will pick up acidity, which is what makes mm -hmm. things it like refreshing, right? Like it's like mm -hmm. lemonade, right? Yeah. You want something that's got some acid to it. Um, and then as you exhale after you swallow, you'll get the alcohol content. So you can kind of like come up with a flavor profile and then, you know, the wines, um, my wines, pretty full bodied there's definitely some alcohol there it's dry but there's got it's got great acidity um which is mm -hmm. typical for grecian grapes this is um actually a little greco de tufo in the southern part of italy 
Okay. And it makes me want a creamy pasta, some kind, <laughs> like a carbonara, um, or like rabbit cacciatore or something. Um, but yeah, that's how you more or less talk about wine. You kind of break it down into those elements and like say, well, is there fruit? If so, what kind? And okay. yeah, I don't know it if that's too complicated. <laughs> it always amazes me. No, it it just ama it amazes me when you anything like this always amazes me because it's just like presumably our right there's like this is like a pro a question in philosophy right is like presumably our bodies evolved to survive not to and our senses evolved to make it easier to survive not to like perceive reality objectively right mm -hmm. um and so with that in mind it always amazes me that you know our senses can be such fine-tuned instruments whether it's you know, tasting a wine and being able to tell so much about it and being able to say so much about it or whether it's being able to observe kind of the movement of kind of the heavenly bodies so clearly that you can shoot a, mm. you know, a rocket ship onto a comet a million miles away, right? It's amazing. it's just, yeah, it's amazing. And it, it makes me think like, well, you know, there's there's something more than just survival, right? There's There's a sense in which our senses are in some sense maybe made to perceive reality or to perceive those aspects of reality that, you know, we're meant to perceive, I don't know, but. <laughs> well, in any field too, and my husband's a big car guy and what amazes me is he can hear it. We live downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we're going to sleep at night, he'll hear a car and I'll be like, oh, that's a blah, 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 blah. My like, dad can do like, that too, can, yeah. And I have no idea what he's talking about. Like a car <laughs> being loud, I call this zoom zooming their room rooms. Like, <laughs> like they all sound the same to me, more or less. Yeah. Um, but he's able to like enjoy the sound and understand the sound. And it's always amazing to me mm -hmm. that there are so many different fields that you can like get as infinitely deep as you want to and still never reach the bottom. Right. Yeah. Like you could never learn everything about cars or wine mm -hmm. or astrology, astronomy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that. And I wanted to talk to you about kind of what it's like being in kind of, so we've kind of talked about community as in kind of bringing people together around food and wine. And I also wanted to talk to you about like the sommelier community in general. Like, I don't know if you've watched it. I'm watching uh, The Queen's Gambit on Netflix right now. Uh, Quite good. Are watching it. Oh, it's so good. I have one episode left, so don't spoil it for me. Um, but what really strikes me is how there's this kind of community of people who are just fanatical about chess, and they can just talk about it in so much depth, and they have their own shorthand about it, and it seems like whenever they're together, all they want to do is like play chess and talk about chess and, you know, argue about chess. And it's, it's something that like you said with cars and, you know, like I am with wine to a degree that's, you know, largely inaccessible to anyone else. But when you find someone else that can see that particular slice of reality with as much clarity and complexity as you can, it's like, it's all you want to talk about, right? Especially when you find people who are much better at it than you are, even though that's quite intimidating. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as an intellectual pursuit, um, I find I'm most engaged with my community when I'm studying to test. Um, and I really enjoy that. It's like preparing for a marathon, only mm -hmm. it's you're doing it in addition to your job and you're tasting all the time and you're studying all the time and you're trying to bring all those things together to make sense of all of them in different ways. Um, and then you know, try to remember things that don't seem important or find the reason why they're, they must be important. Um, and I'm really lucky, at, you know, when you're kind of at the top in the wine world, there's really only three markets where you have access to like all the wine, right? And some of the best communities. And it's, you have to be in New York, you have to be in California, or you have to be in Texas. Um, so I'm really fortunate to be in the biggest market in Texas with like a lot of the best sommeliers in the country. And um, my tasting group is like the core of my community. <laughs> Um, and we used to do it every single week before COVID and um, like, like putting yourself through a blind flight with somebody who's much better than you is the most humbling thing you could possibly do. You might have a good day and you might nail it. Um, or you might have a terrible day and you might miss all of your wines. Um, 
and, and, you know, then you have to talk through it all. Um, that's amazing. But if going back to your, your question, you know, that's the good part of community, right? When you are in the trenches with other people who are studying and can give you insight and you can mentor some of them and you're, you're all kind of in this place together and like, which is great, but you can't always live in that place. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's, um, too intense to do. I mean, I know people who've done it for six or seven years and the toll it takes on their family and their own mental health is pretty crazy. Um, which I think about the Queen's Gambit too, you know, how isolating and like, there's a lot of cool parts about what she does, but like, there's also a very clear isolation and maybe slight kind of narcissism that starts to creep in. Yeah. It's maybe not great. Um, and the Somali community is like the high end of the restaurant community. And I think this is the point where we get to talk about that dang article. Yeah, um, yeah. If you if you were if you were up for it, I would be interested in doing that. I'll certainly uh, I'll, yeah. I'll link to the article below and try to find some other kind of articles about that as well. Um, just in the sure. like show notes. Um, but yeah, so you want the, to paraphrase it, or do you want me to try to paraphrase the situation? Yeah. So I mean. In my understanding, like I've read the article and everything, but the Somalia community just kind of had its its Me Too moment, right? Um, and you were you were a major player in that. Uh, so yeah, I'll let you go ahead and, and summarize that. I don't want to speak for you here. So I got back into wine. Um, got into wine back in twenty. This is this story never gets easier to tell. So bear with me. Um, mm -hmm. In 2013, um, right after I graduated college, and um, I took my introductory level sommelier exam. There's four levels of sommelier exams. Um, your intro, um, your certified, which is a good bit more difficult, and I passed that the following year, right after, uh, like a year after I graduated, basically. Um, and then there's the advanced um, diploma, which is what I have now, um, which takes a lot more time and is much more difficult. Um, there's between seven and 800 advanced sommeliers in the world. And then there's the master sommelier diploma, um, which is again, a good deal more difficult. I think it has between a one and 3% pass rate and there's under 300 in the world and less than 30 women in that group. And um, of course, like, well, that seems like a pretty amazing thing to try to go for, right? Yeah. If you're an and, what, and what level are you currently at, did you say? Three, I'm an advanced okay. sommelier. Okay. Normally, if, I, if, I, if today our club was open, you'd see me wearing a suit and a pin. I'm grateful not to be doing that, but yeah, that's kind of the standard. Um, so I got into it, and um, it was a really amazing online community for some ways at that point in time, Twitter specifically. Um, so I followed all of the people, because I was living in the middle of nowhere. There weren't some ways really where I lived. Um, so I followed all of the important people in the wine world to try to get the latest on, like, okay, changes in wine laws. What are people talking about? Like, what insights can I glean from this? Um, and I had a few of them follow me back. Um, and a lot of them were, like, great and to this day have, like, remained and have become some of my best friends. Um, but some of them were not so great and even predatory. So one of the top educators, who was also a master sommelier, um, got in touch with me on uh, Facebook after, you know, following me on Twitter and then adding me on Facebook and invited me to um, a master class on Burgundy in Chicago, which I couldn't make that one. But, you know, my thought was, oh, he thinks I have interesting things to say about wine and um, is interested in furthering education because he was the, uh, like, person um, who was really doing more of that than anybody else at that point in time. Um, and so, you know, we kind of built up a rapport and talked online and he even proofed my wine list when I moved down to Detroit. Um, but he offered me a few things before that, like that should have been a little bit red flags. Like I should have known I didn't deserve them. And I kind of did. Like he offered to let me write for the Guild of Sommeliers, for instance, which is like the premier um, educational um, website for sommeliers. Um, and I knew I wasn't ready to do that. So I turned him down. But like something should have seemed more off than it did to me. And um, eventually it progressed where um, he, I, we were putting together a masterclass in Detroit um, and he had offered to go up north uh, to Northern Michigan where I'm from to write about the wineries there and invited me to go along. I was too busy, so I said no. Um, 
and he was getting increasingly flirtatious over Facebook Messenger, and he sent eventually, and I, he was usually good about redirecting and, and whatnot. Um, you have to be in this business. I mean, you get hit on all the time. Um, as a waitress, I mean, getting my butt grabbed, like that just, like it almost is, at this point doesn't even like necessarily bother me because I know how to take myself out of those situations. And, you know, like at the end of the day, not a lot of harm done, but um, he sent me a link um, to a very explicit oral sex guide. And I was like, this is one of the top people like in my world, um, the world of my profession. Like everybody knows who this person is and like you just you kind of expect there's a level of professionalism they'll never breach right because mm -hmm. like that's what their persona is built around and um I didn't really know how to respond so he asked me if I was offended and I said no because it wasn't that I was offended like we talked about like I'm somewhat comfortable with like dirty humor or whatever um and like whatever else like bodily images aren't startling to me but um there was clearly an intent there that I wasn't comfortable with. So I told him, and the screenshot ended up in the online version of the New York Times um, when we kind of came together and, and brought all this to light. Um, like, I said I wasn't offended, and then I said, um, I don't want to be that frank with my professional contacts, right? Try yeah. to put him back in the space where reminding him he's a professional contact, thereby mm. he should not be behaving this way. Um and, and things progressed and, and there were some other things that made me very, very uncomfortable because I felt like I'd said no. Um, and I took it up the chain and, and, and basically complained about him to the board of directors uh, of the quartermaster sommeliers. And I talked to the chairman, like my, my only demand, because I didn't know what else I could ask for, was that he never proctor any of my exams. Um, but basically I was told by the person in charge that I was being dramatic. Um, and that'll really shift your paradigm in a really crazy way very, very quickly. Um, so I told a few people in my community, um, I think they probably felt like I was being dramatic and like, you know, you start second guessing yourself. Well, it's not like I was raped or anything. So maybe it wasn't that big a deal. Maybe I am being dramatic. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a, another um, situation with a mentor that uh, went kind of similarly wrong. Um, and like there was, but like the thing that blew my mind is somebody had warned me about him, which is like, they were like, never be in a room alone with this guy. Like you, you just can't, like everybody knew about him and that he did this to young women um, mm -hmm. before they had any standing in the community or could defend themselves or knew his reputation. Um, and nobody did anything. And like, never doubt, like the thing it taught me was never doubt there can be something seriously wrong seriously and fundamentally wrong um at any point in time because people won't like there is no like people people are very willing to be blind or to lie to themselves yeah i think this is something you kind of see in various different industries and areas that have kind of had their me too moment right where like you know in hollywood for example you can you can see like um, you know, back in the 90s, people were making jokes about Harvey Weinstein at awards shows about how you don't want to be in a room alone with him, right? It was, so it's one of those things where people know, right? And it just, it's just. Well, and I fun. can't, I can't help but like draw parallels to like racial, racial inequality, right? Mm -hmm. Like things could be extraordinarily bad and that doesn't mean anything's going to be done about it. Um, so it's just an interesting exercise in like, maybe your entire world is messed up and either you don't want to see or you can't see what's wrong. Um, like literally I told 10 master sommeliers about this and other instances and name names and you know, nobody ever did anything about it. Um, so what was the tipping point? Um, so I had multiple instances of this sort of thing happen to me in my career and you know, you start to tell people and they always react so badly. It's like, well, like, he's like a really good guy. Like, you should be talking about that or you're being dramatic or like, that's just, you know, Jeff or whatever else. And um, you learn pretty quickly, like you aren't allowed to talk about it. And if you do, you'll get a bad name and reputation pretty quickly, even if it's true. And even if you never slept with the guy. Um, but so anyways, we carry on a few years 
Um, I got married and furloughed in March of this year. Um, and sometime in the summer, I got a call from somebody that I had told my story to. That was the first person that listened to me, really. Um, and she said, you know, we're collecting stories with the New York Times. And a bunch of us are going to call out the quartermaster sommeliers for um, allowing this sexual predation to continue. And it took me three months to put my name on that, to be willing to put my name on that. Um, I was like, you can have my interviews, you can have my materials, like I have receipts, I have everything. Like you can have all of that, but I don't want to put my name on this because my entire community, I mean, it's 85% male. And you learn pretty quickly that men don't, like these stories make men uncomfortable. Like there's not a space to tell these stories with a lot of them. Um, and it could very much hurt my professional reputation within the community to be a whistleblower in this kind of situation. Most people, you know, now are like, oh, you're so brave, so brave. Well, like there are people that won't talk to me. Um, and also because like they feel like it's damaged the court, right? Like, because there are people now calling for it to be dismantled or whatever. And like some of their friends have maybe resigned or been um, um, like all of the men who were called out in the New York Times article were suspended pending investigation. Like their friends are suspended and like now then you're, you become persona non grata. So and I knew a lot of that was going to happen. Um, but like I was unemployed. So at least my employer um, was there like, what did I have to lose? And what I didn't know that I had to gain, and I was thinking about this earlier today, is like, even if there's a lot that negatively comes from this, being able to speak the truth is incredibly freeing. And I never thought I would be able to just like put my name on something like that or say it out loud. And once you do the thing that you're the most afraid of, you kind of feel invincible after that. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel like anything I can think of right now would scare me more than having done that. And that's pretty empowering. I can imagine. I don't know if that made any sense. Um, <laughs> I was feeling no, like I it does. That story. No, that was, that was great. Thank you. Um, and I will say, yeah, I read the, the article and your story. Well, I mean, which is certainly like way over the line based on what I, I read of the screenshots and saw of the story, but there were, there were other stories I saw in the article that were kind of much more frightening where, you yeah, know, especially basically. you had women who were the one of the men in the the higher positions was the one actually judging their exams and they felt kind of trapped into sleeping with him in order to pass right um yeah the power dynamics are really really interesting and you can be positioned in such a way where like while it might seem like you're consenting the game is so unfair and maybe you aren't Especially if it's somebody that's much more powerful than you and you're in a professional context where there's drinks happening and then all of a sudden they put you in an unprofessional context. Yeah, so this is, I think this goes back to kind of something we were talking about earlier that I thought was was really interesting is you have this, um, you know, we kind of talked about the, the carnivalesque, right? Or the, mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, not being afraid to um, talk about kind of the body and, um, you know, food and wine and, you know, sex and alcohol and all this stuff, right? And how there is a sense in, you know, more straight-laced kind of traditional circles where you don't talk about those things. But then I think on the other side, you have this kind of Dionysian energy where it's like, yes, let's embrace all of this, right? Um, and I think one thing we're seeing, you know, with the I think one thing we're seeing with with what happened with you and with the article is that um, there are downsides to this, right? There are there are casualties. There's damage that comes from this, you know, from embracing this kind of Dionysian energy, the right, like you know, the whole you know the whole kind of um, mentality of like, yes, let the wine flow and like bring in the women and all that. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> Yeah, there's very it's extraordinarily permissive. Right. There's um, this yeah, there's this idea of like I mean the way it was often phrased, even like the term dynasty and that's often used is like, you know, specifically kind of implying like, you know, Christianity came along and, you know, there was there was the ancient world, you know, there was Greece and Rome where, you know, the wine flowed and there was free love and everyone just enjoyed themselves. And then Christianity came along and said, oh, no, 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 you can't have fun and like put everybody in a straight jacket. And now we're like finally breaking out of that. Um, 
which I think is, you know, kind of a misreading of what the ancient world was like if you actually look at how, you know, women were treated. Um, how, or really anybody yeah. who's not in a position of authority is treated. Yeah, exactly. Like if you were the head of a Roman family, um, like any of your slaves, male or female, were basically available to you at any time and had no legal recourse, right? And, you know, if you were a, if you were like a highborn woman, you could, and were raped, you could maybe um, have legal recourse as like a crime against your husband. But if you were a common born woman, nobody, nobody cared, right? Like, <laughs> it was just, so in some sense, like, I think the, I think that's kind of a misreading, but I do think there's something to that. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling now. So no, it's what good. are your thoughts it's on that? Is this like the kind of the, the dark side of the carnivalesque? Yeah, I think it is. Absolutely. I think, I think that there's like, in my mind, like there should be a lot of liberty and a lot of personal responsibility. And when you take your liberties without taking any personal responsibilities, um, that's really where things go south. Um, but yeah, I mean, the culture that was created was an extremely toxic one and not that everything that was created by that group of people is toxic there's a lot of good things but um the culture um the idea that even our professional um conferences like and some of this is fun right like a professional wine conference you end the day and then you go to the bar with your friends and mm -hmm. then you like a lot of these wineries will like rent out houses and throw house parties and like it gets crazy and, like some of it's fun but like at some point like at some point, are you there for the conference anymore? <laughs> you know, um, and like the situations just like, and, and you have to know which situations you just don't want to put yourself in. And if you're young and coming up through and it's, it, and everybody around you is normalized something, um, you might not have, you might not be able to navigate that particularly well. So. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's one thing I've always said that I actually liked about Grove City. There were people who complained about how restrictive it was, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, yes, there were rules in place, but, like, I broke the rules a fair amount. Like, <laughs> you know, you weren't supposed to, you know, you weren't supposed to drink on campus. You weren't supposed to, like, come back to campus drunk, right? And I did that all the time. Um, my senior year especially. I was, you know, you, you talked about how hard you worked senior year and how you had very little time for anything else. I took 12 credits my senior year and spent, I think, Holy most crap. of the time pickled in alcohol. <laughs> I had some good, I had some good times and I made some and cemented some really good friendships, but you know, that was something I appreciated about Grove City was that, you know, you could, if you sort of wanted a college experience where you wanted to drink a lot and smoke a lot of weed and sleep around or whatever, like you could seek that out by kind of finding a particular group of friends, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I certainly knew people who pursued that lifestyle there and you had to be a little more careful about it than you would at like a state school or something, but you could, you could have that. Um, but it wasn't sort of the norm. It wasn't kind of the pervasive sort of dominant culture. And mm -hmm. there were rules in place that I don't think were enforced in a draconian way, um, you know, that you could break if you chose to, but there was always this sense of like, okay, here's here's kind of what a straight line looks like. Here's what the standard and the expectation is. Um, you know, so I think even if you were, even if you weren't the kind of person who rigidly adhered to the rules all the time, it helped that there were rules, right? That there wasn't this yeah. just environment of total permissiveness, right? Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. I think that there's a lot more freedom and limitations than people realize. Mm -hmm. And I learned this in my first poetry class at Grove City. Like, I always thought I liked free verse. And then I was like, oh, no, I just like this because I'm lazy and I'm undisciplined and I don't understand the forms or structure. And then you kind of, you know, submit yourself to the forms and structure and find new and deeper ways of being creative or expressive. And like, I can't help but wonder if maybe that's not the best way to live your life. Yeah, there's a... There's a passage from G.K. Chesterton that I've always really liked where he says, like, imagine there's a, kind of a, an island jutting up out of the ocean um, that's kind of this small circle of just grass that's very high up and there's dangerous cliffs and rocks at the bottom and stuff. And there's a wall encircling the, the island. Um, and then there's children on this lawn 
within the wall that they're playing and, you know, playing really rough and running around and jumping and falling and having a fun time. And then imagine you take the wall down and you come back and what you're going to see is all these children huddled at the center of the island, not even making use of what little space they have and just kind of quivering in terror because they don't want to get close to the edge, right? Um, just because now suddenly the sharp rocks are in play and are a very real threat, right? <laughs> And I've always, I've always liked that, that image for the idea that there is, there can be freedom and limitations, um, and that people don't always necessarily understand what they're asking for when they want to get rid of those limitations. For sure, I love that. I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the exams you take. What is a, what does a smelly exam look like? Is it, you know, is it tastings? Is it kind of um, do you have to have kind of book knowledge, I guess, of, of different wine regions and types of wine? Is it a combination of I'm those? I'm going to store like, real quick. One second. Yeah, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Um, the exams through the Court of Master Sommeliers, which is the program I'm taking, um, once you pass the first one, have three portions. So theory, which basically you can get any question about, like, regions, soil, vintage, um, producers, price points. There's a business section as well, because um, even if you're a really awesome wine geek and you know everything, you still have to be able to sell this stuff to make you know living doing that, um, yeah. which is harder to do than you might think. Um, and then there is a service portion. So you ought to be able to serve bottles and make pairing suggestions and um, there's a technique to doing all of that as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, go clockwise around the table and pour in the correct order, right? The host last and then women first or the guests of honor before them and like do all of that properly. And um, you'll probably be asked to make a cocktail um, and uh, like they'll give you a wine list that you have to memorize in a very short period of time. And you should probably be familiar with like three quarters of those wines just mm -hmm. from your experience in the wine world. Um, so, and then know how to serve them. Do you decant them? What's the temperature you should serve them at? Um, things like that. So, and then uh, the final portion is considered by many to be the most difficult, which is wine tasting. And it's six wines, 25 minutes, um, three whites, three reds. Time starts when you touch the first wine and you'll wine taste for three master sommeliers. Um, the pass rate for the certified and advanced isn't like terrible. I think it's like 60%. Um, once you take your master sommelier exam, it's it's seventy five and uh, notoriously difficult to pass. Nerves will interfere with your taste buds in really bizarre ways too. Yeah, there was a um, there's a professor at Grove City who was a business professor um, named uh, Professor Adels, and she was a dairy goat judge. She was one of like thirty in the country, and she was also a lawyer. She taught like business See. law, and she said that. I asked her one time, like, how difficult was the dairy goat judge exam? And she said, like, well, I'll put it this way. I passed the bar on my first try and I failed the dairy goat judge exam the first time. So, yeah, she said it was it was very exacting and kind of broke down all the categories of how you judge goats. I thought it was, it was very fascinating. You know, I can judge a goat and just say, like, I don't like that one, but there's more to it than that. <laughs> right. This is, a, this is a good goat. <laughs> But like, it's neat to have an expertise that kind of takes you back to the land or like your mm -hmm. sense of taste or things like that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's a, it's a good profession or like dairy goat judging, right? Where you just engage multiple parts of yourself. Yeah. And I love the, I love that there's so much of it that's about soil, right? That's, that's really interesting to me. There was a, there's a letter that it reminds me of, I think from J.R.R. Tolkien to C.S. Lewis, it might be the other way around, but I think I've got it right, where um, he was saying, like, imagine if you lived back in the Middle Ages and you just lived on a farm uh, in a small village, like, every molecule, in, everything you've eaten ever is probably from within, like, 50 miles of where you live. So, like, mm -hmm. every molecule in your body comes from the soil of this, like, very tiny area, right? Whereas... Now it's interesting. Now you can almost like eat the entire world, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I have, um, you know, I probably have molecules in my body from all over the world, right? You know, mm -hmm. I just ate a banana from South America probably this morning. Like, 
Um, That's really crazy. And again, that idea of like conquering through, um, you know, like eating and drinking. Well, then you and I have pretty much conquered the world. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> but there is something, I mean, I know you said like a big part of wine is the soil it's grown in. Um, I know that comes up with like Cuban cigars too, right? Like you can't import Cuban cigars. And there are people from Cuba who like fled the Castro regime and took their seeds with them to, you know, Nicaragua or the Dominican Republic and grow them there. But people who really know cigars say like, it's not the same because it's not the, the soil, right? It's the, yeah, it's and how much of it's yeah, soil, how much of seed. it's yeah. climate, how much of it's clonal selections. I mean, if you ever want to like, like watch two wine people fight, you can pose the question of whether you can taste the soil in the glass. <laughs> right. And some people will say yes. And some people will say no. And like, I think like one of the ones where that comes up is like Chablis, which is in the northern part of Burgundy in France. Mm -hmm. Right. So Chardonnay, but the Chardonnay doesn't really taste like it does anywhere else in the world. And it's planted on, you know, this limestone with this, this, this fossilized, um, like basically mollusks. And some people say you can like taste the limestone in the wine. Well, like, that's not a measurable thing. And there are plenty of people that will argue, well, yes, you can. And there will be plenty of people that will argue, well, no, that's impossible. Like, no, you can't, right? <laughs> Which I think is like, it's funny. Yeah, it's gonna know where, to the, where the fault lines are, right? But it- Yeah, I would say that Chablis when it's done well tastes like Stardust and that's like, you know, maybe a more <laughs> artistic way of going about I that. Taste stardust. Right? Yeah, it's just, it, the idea of like, having to study something that requires, you know, one of your concrete senses as opposed to just like your mind, right, is, is fascinating to me, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm an English major, so, you know, I have my MA in English, so my area of, of expertise is literature, so I study, you know, words on a page and, you know, I'm using my eyes to read it, but it's not like I'm looking at paintings, right? Like I'm, I'm basically using my eyes to, you know, scoop words into my head and then thinking about what those words mean, right? Um, so I'm not really using, I'm not really using my senses in some ways. I'm kind of engaging with that as like a brain in a jar almost, not necessarily okay. as like an embodied being. And I think that's something that's tough on a lot of people because for so many people, you know, myself included, like we've gotten to a place where you know, work is on a screen and then leisure is on a screen too, right? You, there's the, there's the meme of like, oh man, I've been staring at my medium screen all day. I can't wait to stare at my big screen while I scroll through my small screen. And it's like, no, there has to be more to life than that, right? Like we have bodies for a reason. You could live like that as a brain in a jar, right? Like, well, and that's where, too, like, the restaurant thing, and, you know, I'm getting a little bit more away from that now that I'm married and have children, but, like, you know, you study all day, and then you go to a restaurant, and you run around like mad to make sure everybody's happy, and their tables are perfect, and the food goes down when it's supposed to, and the empty plates come up when they're supposed to, and they get fresh silverware when they're supposed to, and you give them more water or more wine or another cocktail, and you're carrying around these heavy trays at a very, very fast pace, so by the time you go to bed, you know, maybe have a glass of wine and a bowl of pasta, you're like physically tired and it feels so amazing. You're just like physically, mentally exhausted. And like, to me, that was so much of the draw too. It's like, even, even these days, if I have too many office days in a row or like, I feel a little antsy, like, and I don't really have time for the gym these days because it's, my life is too busy. Um, you know, like I don't necessarily feel good like my my body and my my brain are kind of equally energized or tired at any given time yeah i think it's yeah there there is definitely something good about feeling tired right like it's like ah yes i you know i used my body today and i got all this work out of it it, it feels good right like i know like shortly into quarantine i kind of realized that you know, working from home and looking at a screen and then kind of watching TV at night, looking at a screen. I was like, okay, I have to do something that's not a screen, right? Like, so I started making, um, you know, at one point I was, I was kind of, I was actually out of work at the beginning of the quarantine. So I started making um, furniture out in our like courtyard of our apartment complex. 
um, just because I was so bored. There was there was nowhere to sit. Um, so I, I, mean, I noticed this, like there was, I live in kind of a garden apartment complex. So they're like three story brick buildings and there's no balconies. So if you want to go outside, you have to like go outside. Um, but I noticed that people would, you know, let their dogs out and then come right back inside or they'd go out and smoke a cigarette and come right back inside because there was nowhere to sit. And people didn't really know each other much um, as is often the case, right? With, with apartments, like my first two apartments, I didn't know any of my neighbors. And I was like, okay, if we're all going to be stuck here, we might as, during this whole quarantine thing, we might as well get to know each other and maybe people would stay outside and get to know each other. So if there was somewhere to sit. So I went to Home Depot and bought some wood and built this bench um, for the courtyard. And that's the name of this podcast is The Bench. Um, because it, you know, when I built that, like through that, I kind of have gotten to know all my neighbors really well, or at least some of them. And we've had, you know, we've become really, really close. Uh, close friends over the last few months and it's been really valuable to me so it just got me thinking about community and different ways to build community and think about community and that's why I really wanted to do this project. Um, Have you been building anything since? So when it started getting cold I kind of stopped um, but yeah I built a few mm -hmm. other things. I built two benches, I built like some shelves for one of my friends, I built a bookshelf for somebody else and I built an end table for my own apartment. Um, and then I also made some, I also switched gears a little bit and made some jewelry out of uh, like beach glass. So here's, uh, here's like a rosary I made. That's beautiful. Um, thank you, yeah. So I I've love made, that. Like, I've made like six of those and I've sold some of them to my friends. Uh, so that was really fun. Um, and it was just good to get out of my head for a little bit, you know, and, and do something with my hands, right? Yeah, I love um, that. Again, it I'm occurs to me, too, that kind of what you've done, you know, in a society where we're constantly able to, like, get out and move and travel and whatever, where we're almost too free to get to know, like, our own community. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that you did that in your apartment because it's like, you know how you were saying, like, if you had lived, you know, 500 years ago, everything that you knew would be within like a 30 mile radius or whatever, like maybe certain parts of society could lean back that way. Maybe in that sense, quarantine's a good thing. I don't yeah. know. No, I think there's something to, I think there's definitely something to be gained uh, from getting to know your neighbors because, you know, to the, to the degree that you know, your neighbors are sort of almost a random grab bag of people. I mean, obviously, except from, like, sort of the general demographics of the area, like, they're probably roughly equivalent to you in, like, income, and depending on where you live, there might, you know, whether it's a more racially homogenous or heterogeneous area or whatever. Um, but other than that, they're, like, a pretty random selection of people um, that you haven't chosen based on any kind of shared interests or characteristics, right? Um, mm -hmm. so I think there is something really good about getting to know those people, you know, if only so it can be like, yes, I can, I can live with these people that I live next to, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that's something that's, that's been lost to a, to a large degree. Um, so yeah, um, what else did I want to say? Oh, I was really interested in something you said earlier when you were talking about um, wine, a like a really good bottle of wine is like a work of art, but something that's, you know, temporal, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, might only taste good for 30 minutes. It also struck me that it's, you know, a work of art that, you know, very definitely needs um, a, I guess viewer is the wrong word, like a consumer, I guess, or uh, someone to interact with it, right? Otherwise, it's just a brand, right? It's like we joke about this with wine brands, like where somebody who like might not know anything about wine knows that all of their friends drink Camus and Silver Oak, and it's like your chick friends that all have <laughs> Louis Vuitton bags and like have no idea if the quality is there or not, but like you're yeah. supposed to like Louis Vuitton, so like mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Which is just kind of funny, and like some wine brands. Um, are, are, you know, worth it, and, like, that label means a lot, and um, some are maybe more marketing ploys, or <laughs> they're not bad wines, but they're so expensive for what they are. Like, there are certain wine brands, like, 
that are so much more expensive than when I started drinking wine. And like, I'm not that old. So that says something. It's like, okay, well, like maybe Camus isn't like a good or a bad wine, but maybe it's expensive for what it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when I was in the restaurant, it was like $200 a bottle. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a $200 wine. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's cool to be able to assess even just that. Right. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you if your handbag was worth $400. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to what you were saying, I'm sorry um, for like going on that tangent. No, but you're good. You, you, all, you really do need like a viewer for sure. Um, you know, I think it's funny sometimes people like, will, like demean their own palate. They're like, I don't know if I have a wine palate. But let me tell you, if you give even an uninformed wine drinker and, like, usually they have to be a little past 21. Like, they have to have a little experience, but usually not a mm -hmm. lot. A really good glass of wine, they know it's a really good glass of wine, mm -hmm. even if it's not the style they usually like to drink. Like, if you give somebody a glass of Chateau de Cam, which is one of the best dessert wines in the world, even if they don't like sweet wine, they will know that's a good wine. Or, like, if you poured yeah. a glass of, like, like, really good Bordeaux that was 30 years old for somebody that only drank, mm -hmm. like, you know, young Napa Reds, they would still usually be able to recognize like that that was a great wine. So that's like really cool to watch. Like some of it's subjective, but like the great wines are objectively great wines. That is really cool because I know, I'm sure you've like encountered this, but with, you know, with the world of wine and everything, there is a lot of like, you know, among, among the, uh, the hoi polloi like me, like there is I, um, you know, I don't necessarily share this view, but like among people who aren't wine people necessarily, I feel like there's a lot of like skepticism toward it, right? A lot of cynicism, I guess, maybe where it's like, oh, this is all just, you know, this is all just pretentious. It's all just about money or it's all just marketing, whatever. Like, so it is really cool to hear that, like, no, there is this objective thing where like you can, you know, give a complete barbarian this really great glass of wine and they'll, they'll know that there's something you know, different there, right? Yeah. Um, I did, I had the distinct privilege of getting to judge at the San Francisco International Wine Awards um, three years in running, not this year because COVID, mm -hmm. but um, so that's like an entirely different category of wine than I usually work with because the restaurants I work in are pretty high end. Um, and those are like grocery store wines. Like, you know, you go to the grocery store and like on the bottom shelves, there's like little gold or silver stickers yeah. and like, 92 points and you're like well how can this six dollar chardonnay get 92 points and i've always wondered that i'm like who's out there giving awards to this seven dollar bottle of wine oh dude so they're put into price categories so like you you judge like chardonnay between like one and five dollars or chardonnay under ten dollars mm. right so then you have to judge it based on is it does it behave like chardonnay is the wine objectively good is the wine a good chardonnay and like is it really, really good for like under ten dollars? And like you taste thousands of wines over a three day period. But like it's really cool to be like, is this wine Chardonnay? Like, like it's like, oh, I like this wine, but it doesn't represent Chardonnay the way the consumer would want Chardonnay to be represented. Then mm -hmm. you can't give it like necessarily hundred points because like mm -hmm. then the person that that's looking for a really good Chardonnay is going to buy the wine and be like, well, this doesn't taste like Chardonnay at all. Yeah. And you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So yeah, but my favorite example of that was um, when you're kind of like new and they'll give you like the, <laughs> I was, I, I have every year I've been there, been the youngest person in the room, I'm sure by quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. They'll give you like the fruit wines and like the fruit flavored wines, it's like, because mm -hmm. nobody wants to judge those. So <laughs> um, I had like fruit flavored wines and fruit flavored Moscatos. So I'm tasting these oh, fruit flavored wow. Moscatos, which like, according to wine people, you should probably, like, red the best. And sweet wine is for, like, sorority girls. Like, forget <laughs> those rules. Those are, like, rules for people who want to think they know about wine. But, like, genuinely, there's, like, great wines in every category. Fruit and fruit-flavored wines included. So I'm tasting this fruit-flavored Moscato, and I get to this passion fruit Moscato. It's, like, 13 bucks at Kroger, I find out later. <laughs> and, like, this is, like... A really good Moscato and moreover if there was ever a fruit flavored Moscato this is exactly what I would want it to be like so I got to argue with both of my judge counterparts who were like well you can't give like a high score to a fruit flavored Moscato like what are you like why yeah. like well yeah. if there was like an ideal 
for a fruit flavored Moscato, this passion fruit Moscato mm -hmm. is like the right amount of Moscato flavor and the right amount of passion fruit flavor. It doesn't taste artificial and it's like zesty and has acid to balance out the sugar and the fizz is like texturally perfect. And like, I've like fought for that wine and I think we, we gave it over 90 points. And so then like <laughs> three months later, I'm walking down the Kroger aisle, right? Like, and I find this little screw cap, like horribly labeled Moscato that like just looks cheap and chintzy but like tastes dang good and like I see the little like cardboard thing on the neck that's like 93 points from the San Francisco <laughs> International Wine Awards and I'm like I fought for that wine you did it <laughs> pretty cool I'm sure they're grateful which by the way wine pairing Moscato and dream sickles in the summer okay all right I'll really really mind. good you might yeah. not like sweet wine but that is amazingly and objectively delicious that sounds really good. That was um, that was the first. Uh, I think the first bottle of wine I probably ever bought for myself was was Moscato. Um, got it from a it's gas only like station. It's like five percent alcohol. Yeah. Got it from a gas station in Ohio. I think I was. <laughs> I think I was like eighteen. <laughs> but this gas station did not care. <laughs> no, they often don't. <laughs> but yeah, oh, wow, that's so cool. Um, I just love the idea of judging these wines by by taste, right? Like it's, I think I mentioned this when we talked a while ago, but it reminds me of when, of the classes Dr. Drake gave where he'd give you a test that would, um, that would be on paintings and it would be, you know, in, in previous art classes I'd taken and it had been, you know, answer multiple choice questions about this painting or whatever and tell me like, you know, who painted it? When was it painted? Like, what is the story being told in the painting? Like, you know, what, uh, you know, or the, you know, what technique was you, what's the name of the technique that was used to create this effect in the painting or whatever? And then, you know, Dr. Drake's exam would be like, okay, I'm gonna, add, um, okay, here's like seven super close up pictures of like people's arms and legs, like put them in order from right to left in the painting. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, how do I study that? But he was like, yeah, I want you to know the paintings. I don't want you to know information about the paintings, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, yeah, I think there's really something to that where, you know, in the same way that it's like, you know, you do have to have the theory part of your exam, right? Where you have to talk about different regions and stuff like that. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, you do have to know the wines. You don't just have to know information about them. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that we were talking about, like to bring it full circle with, with different forms of worship, it's like, you know, this isn't just information, right? It's not just, you know, I've certainly been to churches where it's like, okay, show up, like a couple worship songs, very, very long sermon, like hour long sermon, you know, one more worship song and we leave, right? And it's like, okay, this just feels so information heavy to me, right? Like, Mm -hmm. You know, you have the musical part, but, you know, I've been, that's one thing that like became really important to me as I got older was like going to a church where, you know, they had the Eucharist every Sunday because this idea of like taste and see, right? That it's, it's not just about hearing and internalizing information. There's a sense in which it's something you live, not just something you know, right? Mm-hmm. I love that. I would say, like, lately, like, I would probably, again, if I were, you know, not married, like, the person I'm married to is, is very much in a different tradition than I come from, but I very much kind of come from that tradition as well. But now in the South, going to some of these churches, it's like, I'm not even kidding you, sometimes, like, two and a half hours of worship and, like, a short sermon. Or, like, yeah. there's really no sense of time at all. So, like, it could, you could be there two hours or, like, you could be there four and a half or five. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's just a totally different way of looking at it. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, there's, like, in some sense, I appreciate that. It's, like, okay, well, like, the balance between, like, experience and, like, intellect, intellect can be yeah. manifest in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, like, I do think there's... You know, there is definitely a sense where people from kind of more traditional branches of Christianity tend to look down their nose at more kind of contemporary, like, evangelical worship, where it's like, oh, you just want to have a, you know, like, oh, there's just fog machines and strobe lights, and it's crazy. And I'm like, well, what, do you think that, like, 
if they'd had if you know the Catholic Church in the 1600s had, had fog machines, they wouldn't have used them. Like, have you seen you know Baroque style churches? It's like right where there's like sunbursts made of gold and like all this stuff i'm like they they would have used fog machines if they had them like right the point was to just you know awe people and sweep them up in this experience yeah right? i went to joel osteen's church actually oh, he's in houston and it was like but like it's just one of those things where you know to see all of the stops pulled out is like very interesting and in like the mega church tv experience and mm -hmm. i'm glad i did it i don't know that i could go there but like yeah it's also good to be in a position where you've gone through a few different phases in terms of how you think you ought to do something and say like, not that all forms of worship are valid, but that usually some of them, well, usually a lot of them are very well reasoned and sometimes mm -hmm. it's about good fit as well, maybe. Yeah, definitely. I'm like, I'm certainly glad I, you know, tried many different things, right. In terms of, mm -hmm. of worship. Like I, you know, I grew up in a really liturgical kind of Lutheran church and then I, spent some time going to more contemporary kind of evangelical churches and I've I'm glad I did because I didn't really see the value in the tradition I grew up with until I tried other things and then I was like oh I want to I really want to come back to I really want to come back to this and kind of seek out a more a more liturgical you know traditional worship experience um yeah um I'm trying to think if I have anything else I really wanted to ask you but I've really really enjoyed our conversation here um and we've been going for about an hour and 40 minutes now so oh wow yeah i mean time flies right um yeah i wanted to ask you don't you um or didn't you at one point um in your church kind of pick out the different communion lines for different times of the for different seasons of the church year was that no am i remembering I think... that correctly Okay. Not quite. So it's my ambition, though, at some point, and I've never been in the right church long enough where this could be done or never had the, the means to do it. But like, mm -hmm. I really hope someday when I'm part of a church that like my tithe can be done in wine, yeah. <laughs> like appropriate wine for communion, not like the stuff. Like I remember preparing communion with my mom and like it was like this horrible inside joke that we were using like menage a trois. <laughs> My dad would always joke that that was like a Trinitarian reference, um, but like, I'm not sure. That. Anyways, but like it was the right price point and like it yeah. was moderately palatable, but like they would just like stop it and then like pump the air out of it and then put it in the fridge for the next week. And like, mm -hmm. like I've had corked communion wine, like wine that is objectively like faulty and like it detracts mm -hmm. from the moment. And also you probably shouldn't have wine that's so good that like it distracts yeah. you. Yeah. But, like, I like the idea of, like, taking something from my trade that I know a lot about mm -hmm. um, and then giving something of good quality yeah. related to that in a way that's servicing to the church, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's a way that you could definitely add to the the experience of it. I remember when I studied abroad in Spain, uh, in Malaga, I went to a, there was a Church of England church there that worshipped in English, and it was, like, the only English language church in the city, so that's where I went. Um but it was, they would have um, Malaga wine as the communion wine, which, have you, have you had Malaga wine? Uh, like the sweet one, the sweet Yeah, stuff. yeah, it has yeah. like a really, really unique taste, at least from what I remember. Um, and yeah, I remember the first time I took communion, I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> I, uh, the, so I worked on the newspaper at Grove City, and the newspaper advisor, his name was Nick Hildebrand, he... Uh, his dad was a pastor, and he he remembers, like, as a kid going to the liquor store with his dad to buy communion wine, and he said that for, I think for, like, Lent, his dad would always buy Mad Dog 2020, <laughs> because he was like, yeah, I want them to wince, you know, it's a season of penitence, like, I want people to take a sip and be like, oh. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, that would make you wince, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, I remember... I was uh, I was a row at Grove City. Um, I was in the the Tri Rose uh, housing group, and the, we always the cool joke, housing group. Yeah, the cool I ones, the, the the apathetic smokers. Um, but we always I don't know if it was a joke or if it was true, but we always said that the group was named after Wild Irish Rose, um, which is one of the most disgusting liquids I've ever drank in my life. But. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm just kind of 
talking, like I probably won't include that in the in the episode because it has nothing to do with anything. But yeah, you feel good. Yeah, yeah, I feel pretty good. So if you want to, if there's anything you wanted to kind of leave us with, I'd, I'll give you a chance to do that. But otherwise, I think we're good. Hmm. I guess if there was one thing I would want to pass on, um, try things that you think you might not like, um, especially in restaurant situations. Because usually, like, when we got into this with wine a little bit earlier, like, things that are objectively good will transcend what you like. You should be able to recognize them as, like, well-made and crafted. And maybe sometimes having things that are well-made or crafted influence you as opposed to you saying, I like these things. What falls within that category can be a really rewarding experience. And drink sparkling wine, especially champagne with anything fried. Like, seriously. Like okay. champagne and potato chips, fried chicken, like French fries. That's like movie night at my house. Like that's what we do. And you should definitely try it. I really want to try champagne and fried chicken now. I, that is a great idea. Thank you. I will, I will take that to heart. Um. <laughs> Sometime at some point you'll have to come over to our place for a dinner party. Or if we go down there, we'll have to throw a dinner party. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I mean, if you're ever in DC, certainly look me up. Where, what city are you in again? I'm in Houston. Okay, Houston. Yeah. Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I know, like, so many people are moving to Texas, so I'm sure I'll have to go visit there at some point. Um, well, you know, take Marissa. Yeah, she, definitely. She needs to see my sister. Yeah. I haven't seen Meg in a long time. I think it's since the wedding, I think. Um, yeah. Meg was very impressed that we had French bubbles at the reception. That's how she phrased it, French bubbles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. But yeah, well, thank you so much for, for joining me here, and I'll uh, let you have the rest of your night. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Yeah, bye. Night.